Okay, so my talk today is going to be about how we can use molecular dynamics uh, to extract some useful information from uh, neutron scattering experiments. And just for those who have trouble visualizing this, uh, data shovel. Okay, we're going to do some data mining here. Now, there are three things that will probably strike fear in most of the people here. Not my shirt, but um, first of all, I will be talking about liquids. Liquids. Secondly, I will be talking about solutions. And thirdly, I will be talking about biomolecules in solution. Right, so these are, the, I, I've seen this symposium so far, and I've not seen really any of these things. So, um, you also might be wondering what this thing is. This is an infrared thermometer, and it can be used for many things, like, for instance, measuring the temperature. This is basically um, sugar burning in an oxygen. And this is putting out, out about the same energy as your metabolism puts out in a couple of days. <coughs> From this, you get three important lessons. Number one, you're all extremely wasteful with beers. Number two, when you're metabolizing, make sure not to do it all at once. And number three, I am holding the infrared monitor. So, um, what are we actually after here? Well, we want to bring together molecular dynamics to actually learn something useful um, from neutron scattering. And these two techniques actually have, um, as I think this conference has made clear so far, they, um, if you'll excuse the term, they have a synergy together. That we can get things out of bringing these two techniques together that we can't from either individual. And there are two main areas where these techniques overlap. The first one is it, it gives us a focus of where there is something that we don't understand. So if we have our, say for instance, our molecular dynamics simulation and our experimental data, and they don't match, there's not a congruence to them, this gives us a, an area to focus our research on. It tells us that there is something here that we don't fully understand. And that can be half of the battle, just knowing where there is a problem. The second thing is, when you do get good congruence between your simulations and your experiment, that you can use the simulations as an interpretive tool for your, um, for your neutron data. Now, with the biomolecules, we're really interested in um, uh, how these things work. And if you're not <coughs> entirely convinced of the importance of biomolecules, I know this is a tough sell, so this, I've not really seen any mention of molecules so far in this talk. If you take a look at the person to your right, and then to your left, these people are about 30 weight percent uh, biomolecules in water. And if that's not impressive, then you can also remember that not just the people you're looking at, but you are also a 30 percent <laughs> solution of biomolecules in water. Okay, now all of these things have a fairly generic, uh, this is just molecular dynamic simulation of a small protein. And I put this up for a, a fairly specific reason. All of the behaviors of biomolecules in water are balances. So for instance, this little alpha helix here is a balance of the hydrogen bonds down the helix, and the whole thing is immersed in water. The water's not visible, but there is a balance between these two, hydrogen bonds with itself, hydrogen bonds with water. Or for instance, we have hydrophobic groups like this tryptophan here and the protein at the back. There is the competition of the interactions with themselves versus with water. Everything is a competition here. Or this um, anion cation salt bridge in the foreground. Again, it's a competition of the interactions with itself and the interaction with water. Now, what we're really after here is um, something that we can identify, specifically identify the neutron data that is relevant to something that we think is important from the simulation. We don't just want to measure stuff and sort of say it's vaguely similar. We want to identify something specific in the neutron data. Okay, so um, for the neutron scattering, this is obviously what a neutron beam looks like, nice monochromatic neutrons scattering around, and you get a scattering pattern which you can average, and this, I've just put sodium chloride in this solution to begin with because 
it's easy and people understand sodium chloride solution. And we can Fourier transform this sum of partials to give a, a real space representation. Now, there will be those who say this is very kind, <coughs> we're real scientists here. We want to know what real neutrons look like. And so this is what real neutrons look like. This is a sample. That's the sound of a beam shuttle opening. And that is what neutrons look like. Now, there will be those who say, hang on, these are only thermal neutrons, so they're only going about a couple of kilometers per second, or about seven times the speed of sound. And I know your camera actually operates in visible light. And visible light is about one and a half to three electron volts. And that means that our neutrons only have about a third of an electron volt energy. So why can we see them? And that's a sort of completely by the by point. Um, I'll leave that as a teaser for later. Um, so, we get this measurement from our neutron scattering. It's a summation of partials. And we need to understand the rough, or, um, the way, um, the rough proportions that we're going to get these things in aqueous solutions such that you'll be able to understand um, how we get to this measurement that is directly relevant to the interactions that we're interested in. <coughs> and so if we have, only have one component in our solution, then of course we need one correlation. Argon would be a nice example. Um, if we have two nuclei, for instance water, hydrogen and oxygen, we have three correlations. You know, hydrogen, 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 oxygen, oxygen, oxygen. <coughs> there are not many solutions with three, but we would get six. Sodium chloride, a very, very simple solution. We're already up to ten bloody correlations here. The thing is getting messy. And when we actually get into these real bio biological systems, it really increases. And, and that's a big problem. Now, you also, um, the other important thing is that these partials are actually made from prefactors and, and structure terms. And these prefactors, for instance, this C guy here, is its product of four terms. The atomic concentration of the two nuclei in question and the coherent scattering of the two terms of the, of the two nuclei in question. Now it's important that um, to a first degree approximation, let's not get to I forget who it was who said, you know, the neutron scattering lines are a bit of a democracy, they're all kind of samey. Well that's that's sort of true. So let's just say they're all the same for the moment. And so let's take our three molar solution of sodium chloride. Sodium chloride's got a molecular weight of about 50, 60, that sort of thing. So a three molar solution is 150 grams of salt in about a litre, a kilo of water. So it's about a 10% solution by weight. That's a really quite concentrated solution. So how does this look in terms of atomic concentrations? Well, even this really uh, concentrated solution is still about two-thirds hydrogen, one-third oxygen, and even under this 10 weight percent solution, we're only got about one and a half atom percent of our uh, solute. And this, the reason this is important is because these prefactors, when you get the uh, correlations between the solutes, they have very low weightings. And that low weighting is primarily driven by the actual low atomic concentrations of these components. So this is what it would look like for a real sodium chloride solution. So as you can see, um, I've colored them hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen to everything else, everything else to everything else. You can see that these prefactors are predominantly driven by the atomic concentrations. So it's mostly what we're going to get in our measurement of a sodium chloride solution is hydrogen, hydrogen, and hydrogen, oxygen, neither of which we're particularly interested in. All the interesting stuff is down the bottom. So what we actually get out of our measurement is, okay, so we have our uh, reciprocal space partials here, the weighting factors here, the product of those two is that, and we measured the sum of all of this. That's what we get out of our neutron scattering experiment. It's a, it's a mess. We need to get this down to something more manageable. Um, so what we're going to do for the first case is, we're just going to do the isotopic substitution. So we're going to make two identical solutions. So the structure of these solutions are identical. The only thing that we've tweaked is uh, the one of the nuclei. So now you'll recall that um, th this is our waiting for our prefactor. 
that the atomic concentrations of these are going to be the same for, say, hydrogen. The scattering lengths are, of course, the same for hydrogen. These prefactors are identical in both of these solutions. In fact, the only ones that are different are the ones where we've actually substituted the chlorine. Um, you might well take a look. This, this is now real neutron scattering data off D4, by the way. Um, you might look at these two and say they're the same. And this is sort of true um, in that if you actually plot them up on the same scale, there are really quite modest differences between these two. Um, but it turns out that little <coughs> things can be really quite important. So if we subtract these two, of course, everything where the prefectures are identical vanishes completely, and all that we're left with is this, the correlations <coughs> of our substituted nucleus. And of course, because most of our solution is hydrogen, we've, we've now gone down from 10 correlations to four, and of those four correlations, only two of them have big weightings. That's the correlation to the hydrogen to our substituting nucleus, and the correlation of oxygen to our substituting nucleus. And just so you know, this is the direct difference between these two. Um, so we're down now to the level of signal to noise, but even at that, the, these sorts of differences have revealed to us almost everything that we know about ions in aqueous solution. So these really small differences can be both informative and very important. So you've got to be really quite critical about what's the same and what's different here. Okay, so now let's take the terrifying leap and put a molecule in here. So the molecule we're going to do, this is just a molecular dynamic simulation of pyridine. This is a three molar solution of pyridine in water, so it, it looks fairly cluttered, right? Um, pyridine's great because it's hugely soluble, got almost infinite solubility, but it does. Um, and the other nice thing about it is we can do HD substitution on the hydrogen. These, uh, this molecule is available um, in both the hydrogenated and deuterated form. So we get a first order scattering difference just on, on these guys. And so now um, we actually come to our, again, this is our data off D4. These are our substituted nucleus. This is the pattern for our deuterated pyridine, our hydrogenated pyridine. And then when we do our first order difference, we just subtract these. All of the correlations that we're not interested in vanish. And now we're left with this thing, which is mostly the correlation of our substituted nucleus to the exchange balls, substituted nucleus to oxygen, and some other crap, which actually turns out to be important. We'll come back to that later. Anyway, we can just do a direct Fourier transform of this, right? So this is now really um, simple stuff. This is the direct Fourier transform of the data. Nothing um, fibrish, no tweaks, no nothing. And so you can see there are some ringing errors that you pick up due to this, this, this background here. This, um, this, this comes from the inelastic scattering of hydrogen. And if you sum up all of these prefactors, you find out they come to about 100 millivans. So this is the lower limit here. And even at this point, you can see this here is the correlation from our substituting nucleus to the carbon. The second peak here is from the substituting nucleus to the next two heavy atoms. And this peak is to the next two heavy atoms. And then that last guy there. So even at this point, just this raw difference, you can see all sorts of molecular structure in there, which is it's reassuring. And there's also a neat little trick that you can do at this point, and that's, we know what a carbon-hydrogen bond looks like. That doesn't really do anything for us. So what we're going to do is we're just going to set the, um, the R space function to zero, uh, to the low R limit, and delete all of that first peak up to here or somewhere. And then we're going to back for a transform that into, into Q space. And what happens when you do that is you find that you've very effectively removed all of this plaque check um, effect here, and it beautifully oscillates around zero. Um, so that's actually quite a nice little trick um, if you don't want to try and fit these things. It turns out that most, of, if you just do a Fourier transform this um, this background here, it's very high frequency, very low R. So that's why this is actually quite an effective way of getting rid of this. Right. So from our molecular dynamic simulation, we actually calculate any G of R that we want, and this is just a sort of uh, the dynamic representation of how these things converge. Um, and the reason this is quite nice, well, I mean, first of all, it shows you it converges from the high R to the low R. Um, but that means that we can calculate from this simulation the correlation of our substituted nucleus to 
everything else in solution. The reason that we want to do this, of course, is we know what our experimental measurement is. It's the summation of all these, which means that when, once we've calculated these JVARs from our simulation, we just have to weight them, sum them up, and this is what we get. Um, and then we can, of course, set this uh, to zero for the same re region that we did with the experimental data. So this one is now entirely calculated from the simulation. This one is measured. So you see there's some fairly good similarities already. And then we're just going to back transform both of them into Q space. And right, so this is just pretty much, we've done nothing to this data. And we're getting some pretty good congruence between the, um, the experiment and the simulation. Now you might say, hang on, this one looks a lot more different. Yeah, these two look more different than these two. Why is that? Um, yeah, particularly in just these nice sharp guys, and these are uh, a bit more smeared out. So what's going on there? Well, you need to understand the relationship between R and Q space. So what I've got here is this is a constant coordination number. And it's just moving around, it's getting broader, sharper, and it's moving around and uh, always integrates to one. So this is what a typical molecular correlation will look like. It's very sharp in R space, which means that it's a long period, a long wavelength in Q space, and it's also very poorly attenuated. Sharp peak, poor attenuation. So almost everything that you're gonna get, uh, yeah, this, this is still a very strong signal after about five inverse angstroms. If you now make that a broader <coughs> peak, what you find is the wavelength stays exactly the same because the wavelength determines the peak position. However, as this peak becomes broad, it becomes much more severely attenuated in Q space. We're then going to shuffle that peak out to high R. And what you find as you do that, so this is again coordination number one. It looks smaller because there's the R squared waiting in, to turn G of R into a coordination number. But now because it's a high R, it's very high frequency. And because it's a broad feature, it's very highly attenuated. And you'll notice that there is almost no signal above five inverse angstroms. Right? So this is essentially your intermolecular correlations. Your intermolecular correlations only give you a significant signal below five inverse angstroms. And so just to wrap, um, move this around again, the two important ones, molecular correlations, they put all the signal out at high Q. When you actually get to your intermolecular correlations, that's almost all of your signal at low Q. So let's come back now to our uh, experiment and our simulations for the pyridine. And these sharp features, of course, are basically represented by less attenuation here, whereas these broader peaks are more severely attenuated here. You can't see this very easily, but if you plot them up on the same chart, it becomes clearer that the, the blue line, which attenuates more quickly to zero, this is your um, experimental data, whereas the one which maintains the signal at higher Q, that's your sharp peaks from your simulation. Now, that doesn't bother me greatly. We don't really care whether we get the, you know, the carbon-hydrogen bond. Um, we can make the approximation that they're all rigid, and we still get reasonable answers out of our simulation. This is the more great concern, because that's the intermolecular stuff. And remember that we're really after the intermolecular correlations from, um, from this data. Okay. So. Those who um, are thinking about this a little more might make the rather simple observation that this function that you've measured is mostly the correlation to the exchangeable hydrogens and to the oxygens in water, because those are mostly the nuclei in your system. Only about 7% of your correlations are to the carbon, yet that's giving us all of these great big bloody peaks here. Um, and we can actually, because we're getting this out of our simulation, we can actually break down those exactly. So this is the correlation to the, the hydrogens, big, broad features at higher R. So that's, that's, this is what we're more interested in, the intermolecular interactions. And then we plot up the correlations to the K. 
carbon, of course, they're very sharp. This is the molecular structure. We've got no real interest in the molecular structure. We've known what that is for 100 years or something. And it only constitutes about 70% of the signal, total, of the total scattering. So what we really want is a method for getting rid of this, these, these intermolecular correlations, which are really hiding the intermolecular structure that we're really after. So now I want to do a little sort of thought type experiment here. Here I have two boxes of pyridine. This one is one molar, this one is five molar. But of course, the pyridine molecule here is exactly the same as the pyridine molecule here. So if I were to normalize this to some per molecule space, the coordination number of carbons around this guy will always be one, no matter what the solution is. So the question is, is there some magic factor that we can subtract these two and actually remove all of the pyridine <coughs> structure completely? And this is just a sort of proof of concept type thing. So here I have the prediction for a one molar solution and a five molar solution. And I'm just going to scale one of these up. And so scale them and subtract them. What I find is the molecular correlations get smaller and smaller until at some point they vanish completely. They cancel completely and you're left with this funny residual. Now, what is that funny residual? So essentially what we've done is we've taken our scattering, we've normalized it per molecule. So the scattering on this side, that's mostly water molecules surrounding the curry. Yeah? However, with the higher concentration, uh, what we've done is we've substituted some of those water molecules for curry. So we're now actually getting a measure. What this is, this thing which is broad features at higher R is a measure of the intermolecular correlations, and that's what we're really interested in. Now, not only can we do this with different concentrations of the same molecule, but we can do more biologically relevant things. So this is just pyridine in water. We can throw in a denatrin, powerful denatrin, guanidine chloride, very important um, salt in biochemistry. And if we do the same thing, um, that we basically normalize both of these solutions per molecule and do the subtraction. Well, we can we, we need the calculations from these, these simulations just to sort of prove that it works. And so what you've got here is the calculation for the pyridine and water, pyridine, water, and guanidinium, and the subtraction between the two. And what you find is as you scale these up, the molecular structure gets smaller and smaller until eventually it completely vanishes. Now, it turns out you can calculate that factor exactly. All you need to know to calculate that magic factor is the constitution of both solutions. So, this is now actually getting us a measure of how this uh, important denatrin interacts with a hydrophobic species. This is getting really very close to what our golden, um, our holy grail was. Well, what we wanted was a measure of how these interactions compete with other biomolecules versus with water. So, um, that, that's all looking fairly hopeful. Now, because we're doing all of this at the moment from our simulations, right? This is all done from simulations so far, so we know this is exactly correct because we know everything about these simulations. So, we can calculate our first order difference for the one molar box, our first <coughs> order difference from the five molar box, and subtract the two. And this is the difference function that we get, the black guy here. And we can see that this is the water that's been displaced, right? Because of the, we're calculating this from the simulations, we can calculate this in terms of components. So this is the water that's been displaced. Um, in, as, as you go from this solution to this solution, you displace some water and you gain some pyridine. These are the correlations to other pyridine molecules. And this is the total that you measure, the black guy. Now this black guy is broad features at high R, which if you recall, means that in Q space, it's gonna be sharp features at low Q. And so what you have here is the black guy is the back transform of this one. That's calculated from the molecular dynamics. The red guy is what we get from the experiment. And these, these, like I was saying, these are all measured on D4, which I have to say is a, a wonderfully stable instrument. Um, and just so we're clear what we're talking about, this is D4. 
That's the diffractometry. It sort of shuffles around a bit to sort of cover up the blank spots in the, in the detectors. And you can't see it very well, but this is, um, this is it actually acquiring data as it sort of scrolls up. So that, that, that's what the experiments actually look like. So the question comes, can we actually get this sort of level of stability out of these instruments? Well, recently we actually had a chance to test that. So going back a couple of years, we did one of these sort of double difference experiments. So to do these experiments, you need four solutions. So in this case, I'm doing acetone. So I've done hydrogen, hydrogenated acetone in water, deuterated acetone in water, and then I've duplicated that, but with the addition of a salt. In this case, one adenine chloride. And so I have the first order difference of just acetone and water, the first order difference of acetone plus guanidinium in water. And then we repeated this later, uh, a year later. Um, completely different solutions. And so these are the first order differences. Right? There's no fudging whatsoever down here. This is just all I've done is I've taken the difference between those two, taken the difference between the other two, that's that one. And then you calculate this scaling factor this magic scaling factor, and you do the subtraction between those two, and you get to this. So we already, the, the instruments have the stability to measure this sort of thing. Now, why would you be interested in acetone, I hear you ask? Um, well, it turns out acetone is really quite interesting, um, and it matters for how you think it turns out. Um, so, you have these uh, ion channels in your nerves that let through um, certain ions, and those ion channels tend to be made up of these uh, ketone groups, um, carbonyl groups, sorry. And this, uh, uh, for our very crude approximation, is not that far off acetone. It, it's, uh, acetone is pretty much the simplest carbonyl you can do. So we're actually now getting some insight into how these ions interact with motifs that are really quite relevant for biochemistry. Now, this is, I don't see Dan Bauer on here, no? Okay, well, that's a shame, because the, uh, there are other methods of modeling that you can do here. And one of them is EPSR. Uh, this is the Empirical Potential Structural Refinement. <coughs> um, and I have certain issues with this in, actually, first of all, let me just briefly say, uh, we've done these double differences for a whole variety of species. So we've done it for, <clears throat> the top here is all from simulations. The black line is what the predicted double difference looks like. We've done it for species that don't associate, species that do associate. We've done it for powerful denaturants and weak denaturants. Things that weakly associate, we get good congruence. The things that strongly associate, we're doing okay. For the powerful denaturants, we do well. And for the weak denaturants, the whole thing crashes and burns. So this is now telling us that we're not understanding something here, and we've got a pretty good idea why that is. But with all of these, you'll notice that we're down at the level of signal to noise. Right? We can actually see the noise in this data. And virtually everything that is of interest here is below five inverse angstroms. Um, but when you take a look at the EPSR, they don't fit these differences. They fit totals. Right? So we were looking at things that are a couple of millibarns effective size and magnitude. The totals here are some 400 millibarns in, in total. So what the EPSR fits here uh, are for a variety of solutions for sugar and water. And what you've got here is the residuals. And the residuals that you, you can see here, they are orders of magnitude bigger than the signal to noise, which is the level that we could actually compare the molecular dynamics um, to our, our D4 data. Um, and the next, you, you, there, are, there are many papers out using this EPSR, and they're almost universal in that they have reasonable agreement above five inverse angstroms, which is mostly just the molecular structure. This is stuff that you're not interested in. You put this information into the simulation to begin with. It's how they, these species associate together, which is held in the lower Q region. And here the fits are, are really not terribly good, um, to the point where um, the, the explanations that are usually given, there are two of them. The first one is that it's uh, the poorer 
foot in the region below two and a half angstroms is due to uncertainties in uh, the correction to the inelastic scattering conditions, uh, contributions and the finite size of the integration box. The size of the simulations is probably not a significant issue there. Uh, if I were to, uh, yeah, having my discussions with that over the past couple of days, it's most likely due to uncertainties in the correction of the inelastic scattering. Should be noted that these are all collected on spallation sources, not reactor sources. So what I think is actually going on here is you don't really know what you've measured in the lower Q region. There are contributions from a variety of wavelengths of neutrons, and it's really not clear how you're going to correct all of those. So these, uh, yeah, there really is limited value in doing a modeling fit to data where you're not entirely certain what you've measured. And just to put this all roughly in perspective, let me come back to this first order difference um, that I had at the beginning. This is a chlorine difference. And that, bear in mind, <coughs> so these are two totals. This is the first order difference. That tells us, that's told us almost everything that we know about ion hydrations and aqueous solution. And what I'm now going to do is I'm going to take these totals and show how this difference here compares if you actually scale it over onto this sort of plot. And what you'll find is that you, you really, if you're going to fit totals like this, you really need to be very critical of that lower key region. Um, and it's a bit of a shame Dan's not here because I think he needs the right to reply there. But um, anyway, so this is the two overlaps of molecular dynamics and um, experiments is it can highlight where there are areas of conflict. If you're not getting good congruence between your simulation and your experiment, something is wrong. It might be there's something wrong with the simulation, might not be you're measuring exactly what you thought you were measuring. But it, it does highlight where there is an issue. The second thing um, is that if you are getting good congruence, of course, then they are fantastic in the molecular dynamics are fantastic interpretive tools. And I hate worthy slides, so that's all people that I've got to thank. Um, and just so you know, um, that, it turns out, is almost all of the words in the entire presentation. It averages out less than one word per slide. So, <laughs> thank you. I have a question. I didn't quite understand the, the reason for this subtraction of two different concentrations. I mean, you did two measurements, right? Measurement A, one concentration, measurement B, second yes. concentration. So yeah. you have two independent curves, then you get A minus B and only analyze this curve, so you throw away the second independent measurement. Absolutely. So I mean, with all of these things, um, there is the compromise between having more data and having useful data. So like with the first order differences, you go from a 400 millibars of total scattering that you've measured, and to go down to the first order difference in the example that I show here, you go down to about 2.5%. You've thrown away 97% of your data to actually get to the first order difference. But the reason you do that, of course, is because now what you've got left actually tells you something useful. It tells you about the hydration. So what do you get that's useful out of doing the four um, experiments and throwing away, it's even more, it's about 99% of the data, is you actually now get something that is of direct relevance to how these species uh, interact with each other. I'm not convinced. I mean, you have only one curve instead of two, and these curves you have concentration effects for two different concentrations. You, you have everything mixed. I mean, sorry, from the information content point of view, let's say, I, I really don't follow, but we can discuss it later, probably. Okay. Well, I mean, let me just. Um, when. The, the trick, if you like, here is to normalize these things to molecule space. Normally, with the neutron scattering, 
you normalize the volume or per nuclei. That's not what you say. You need to normalize it per molecule space. And what you, what you find is that in one case, you're mostly surrounded by water. And in the second case, you've, got you've displaced some of that water and you've replaced it with other nuclei with different scattering modes. And that is pretty much what you, I mean, it's not perfect, but it's a, it's a lot better than the other options available. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah Phil, I found particularly interesting. I don't, don't think you had showed this to me before, but um, could you go back to the slide where you subtract away, I think, the HC intramolecular and you get rid of the plat check on the left? Yeah. Oh, is that the one where it's the repetition of the experiment? This one. I think it's, uh, no, it's not that one. It's um, earlier no, no, one. I, I, should, I, I just want to make the very okay. point that I didn't make originally. The plat check instantly vanishes when you do this. It's a sign that you've done the experiment well, that you get this huge plat check on both of the first order differences because you're looking at hydrogen. Um, you do the, you normalize it per molecule, and ah, because the plat okay. check is essentially proportional to the number of hydrogens you've got, sign of a good experiment. It all vanishes. Okay, that, that could be related actually, but yeah. it was the other slide where um, uh, you were showing on the left. Oh, these, these, this one. Um, uh, maybe a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was, that, that's the right color. <laughs> okay, so will, will we. Um, okay, let's, let's try this. It's where you were, um, on the right hand side, you had the R space and you. Did it, you suppress the uh, R oscillations up to a certain oh, cutoff that included yeah, the yeah. HC? Yeah. The, the big Fourier stuff. This one. This yeah. is it, yeah. That one. Okay, let's go through here. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Okay, you take the difference, you transform, you put in the whatever and then back transform. Okay, now tell me again, what are you cutting off on the right? So essentially, all you're doing is you're Fourier filtering out. It, it turns out virtually all of this background. Is really high frequent, um, really high magnitude frequencies in unphysical space. So you, what you can do is this, this, a universal trick uh, is to just chop it about here, and that will get rid of most of your plat check without even trying. Uh, it turns out to be that that tends to give you um, errors out here. If you can chop out the first peak as well, it's very the good. first physical peak. The first physical peak, but the nice thing about having this first physical peak is there is only one correlation there. And you know what it is, and it's not really interesting. But can you push this even further, the interpretation? You've chopped out the HC peak on the right, is that right? Correct, yes. Okay. Now, is that saying that almost all the plastic is due to the recoil effect of HC, intramolecular HC? I don't know. Okay. But that is uh, an impressive effect. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, I mean, just, just doing this, it, it, uh, fitting all of these things is a complete nightmare. This is another reason why the double difference is really quite a nice technique, is you don't have to worry about any of this, because it all, if you've done the experiment well, um, it all vanishes. Yeah. Because it, if, if, that's a, if it's not pushing the interpretation too much, it allows you, by cutting out different things, to see which molecular vibrations are contributing the most to your plastic fall off? In other words, you're probing the inelasticity. Um, right. that's, that's an interesting suggestion. Yeah. You can get an idea of which are the which are the bonds that are giving me the main uh, problem with inelasticity corrections. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think that's the case. Okay. It's just that you've got a slope, and that slope is going into real space over a large distance. And it just so happens it's, it's, it's uh, overlapping with the um, other peaks, the physical. Oh, so it's not necessarily suppressing the physical peak that's getting rid of it. It's suppressing what's at, in the same R range as the physical peak. I think so. Okay. But still, it, it works surprisingly well. Yeah. Clearly, the uh, fast oscillations uh, are, well, at low uh, R. Uh, it's not physical, so it's something which is a well-known trick to filter yeah. with a bit of teeth. It may be a well-known trick, but I've seen surprisingly yeah. few people use it. That's true. That's true. Okay. Maybe they just use it, but they don't say it. Uh, <laughs> I mean, this is maybe... Yes. 
So don't say when you use something which is a uh, well known. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, no more questions? Okay, let's uh, thank you all another time.